Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome, and uh, good to see you this morning. And uh, not the not the brightest, the best of days, is it? But um, hopefully, getting together um, as God's people, um, it will be a time of encouragement. And uh, even though it's a bit miserable and um, not so warm out there, um, our prayer is that our time together will will definitely warm our hearts and encourage us. Um, don't know what kind of week we've had, but uh, it's good as we get together just to remind ourselves of God's truth, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, if you're a visitor, a very, very warm welcome. Um, every week when we meet here at Adam Community Church, we, we read God's Word, we, we have a sermon and preach from it, uh, we sing songs based on God's Word and we pray. And um, we always want to remind ourselves of the cross of Jesus Christ and the salvation that's possible through Him. And we were looking at that briefly last week at the end of our sermon. Uh, but we didn't focus massively on these last few verses because of time. But I just wanted to start this week with uh, the last three verses from last week, um, from the book of Thessalonians, where it says in chapter 5, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, and there he's talking about, Um, when Jesus comes back again, whether we've already died or or we're still alive when he comes. Whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him. And that's living with him forever and ever in eternity, um, heaven. Um, Therefore, in light of this, with these truths, with this understanding that salvation has been made possible through Jesus Christ and because of him we can live forever, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact we are doing. So we're going to sing some songs at the start of our service to remind ourselves and encourage each other uh, these incredible truths that Jesus Christ came to say. So let's stand to sing in the darkness field. Mm-hmm. In the darkness we were waiting
afterwards, uh, sometimes we just open things up for people to pray, or maybe there's a verse that you've read this week that you want to encourage others with. Um, so we're going to open it up, and uh, if, if you can lead us in prayer or in verse, then please do that after this song.
We continue to thank you for supplying us, supplying us with all that we we need in Jesus. We thank you for this salvation that's possible through Him. That means we can now know you, the living God, both now and forever, and enjoy all eternity with you because of what He's done. And Lord, we thank you that um, you've given us your Spirit to be with us. We thank you that uh, yeah, the joy of the Lord can be our strength in whatever we're facing. And Lord, we pray that even today, just by getting together with you as your people, um, listening to your word, uh, fellowshipping together, uh, Lord, it will encourage our hearts, that we'll be encouraged. Maybe uh, we're feeling discouraged, maybe we're not feeling uh, so positive about things and things are, uh, are stressing us out or, or we're finding things tough. Um, Lord, we pray that today you'll supply us with what we with what we need. Thank you for each other as well. We thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray that we'd be enriched, uh, yes, for hearing your word and praising your name, but also just for being together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to do our kids talk today. We finished um, a series on the Beatitudes, so Helen's going to introduce um, us to the, the Easter story starting this week, and in the next few weeks we're going to be looking at Easter. So, boys and girls, oh, we do have some, great. I want you to think about a time where you have been to a festival or a maybe a carnival or a street party or maybe a street parade. You know, the sort of thing where we're all kind of feeling a bit like this. There we go. All excited and happy and there's a great atmosphere because everybody is together celebrating the same thing. Well... A few days before Jesus died, that was what the atmosphere was like in Jerusalem because everybody had come together to celebrate. And the thing they were celebrating was something called the Passover festival. Now, the Passover was the biggest, most important festival of the year. And people would come from far and wide to travel to Jerusalem to come and celebrate. And so people's homes were full of family and friends who had travelled. All the guest houses were full to the brim. Out on the streets you might have stalls and kiosks all popping up, selling extra food and provisions. And the streets were crowded and everybody was in that kind of mood to celebrate. There was a real buzz and atmosphere. And this particular year there was even more of a buzz because there was one name on everybody's lips and that name was Jesus because the crowds had heard so much about Jesus they had heard about his miracles they had heard about him raising Lazarus just a short while before and everybody wanted to meet this Jesus and the crowds had heard that Jesus himself was coming to Jerusalem and so the crowds were out on the street, expectant, waiting, excited to meet Jesus. And we're going to watch a video and we're going to see what happened. So that's the triumphal entry. But do you know what? In just a few days, a few short days, the atmosphere in Jerusalem would be totally, totally different. The Pharisees who we saw there silently standing on, watching, seething, with anger, they would finally get the chance they've been looking for to have Jesus arrested. The crowds who were there praising Jesus.
Jesus and singing to him and, and calling out all these wonderful things, the crowds, they would turn against Jesus and they would say awful things to him. And the disciples who were there with Jesus, so happy and proud to be his followers, they would desert Jesus and they would leave him all alone. And yet Jesus knew all that was going to happen. He knew that was going to happen. And he still rode on to Jerusalem because he was about to do something very, very important. But we're going to learn about that next week. But boys and girls, when we go out to Sunday school, we're going to learn a bit more about the Passover festival that they were celebrating. What was its significance? What did it have to do with Jesus? Why does Easter end up at the same time as Passover? So we're going to learn a bit more about that when we get into Sunday school. So as the people were entering into, um, as Jesus was entering into Jerusalem and they were singing and shouting and celebrating, they, they were saying this word, Hosanna, which uh, I, I guess a lot of them didn't really know what they were saying, but it, it's a kind of prayer saying, save us. Um, and maybe they had different ideas of what they just wanted to Jesus to save them from. But as we've already heard today, he came to save us from our sins, uh, to make a way for us to know God and be able to come into his presence. So let's celebrate that. In our next song, Hosanna, let's stand to sing. Take a deep breath because it's quite high. <laughs> <laughs>
pray again, Lord God, we, uh, we thank you for the salvation again that's possible through Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray uh, so much that others would know this incredible truth. And we recognise, Lord God, that um, we heard it from someone or somewhere, or we read your word. And so, Lord, we do pray that as a church you'll help us to, to share this good news message with others in different ways. And to get the word of God into people's lives as well in different ways. Lord, help us to make the most of the opportunities that we have, even now, to, to openly share and, and praise you and meet here in this place so publicly. And we do pray that, um, Lord, it will be an opportunity for others to come and hear the good news. We pray for this Easter time that's coming up and the services that we're holding, the, the books, the craft store that we're going to have here alongside the Easter market that we would. Um, it, uh, Leslie's Abbey, lots of people are putting on. But we pray for opportunities there as we, we share literature and we get the kids doing an Easter craft and we have conversations. And Lord, again, we just pray for you to, to use this Easter time and use us to get the message out to others. Lord, again, we thank you for the freedom that we have to meet together like this. And we again pray for your word. Um, yeah, that it will do the work that you it needs doing in our lives today, Lord, each of us will come with maybe different needs in different places, um, but we pray that uh, what Ryan brings to us um, will speak to us all in individually as well as collectively as a church. And we, yeah, we just pray that even even though um, for many of us we already had our lives changed by you, uh, we pray that you'll continue to change our lives uh, through your word and your spirit, uh, that as we just listen and look at your word. Um, as we or even some, um, our lives will be made new. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to look at God's Word as uh, the teacher is going to come and read to us uh, from uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 5. So we're coming to the end of uh, this series of the book. So these are the kind of closing words. Um, so if you follow the book. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish them, admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard, in love, because of their work. Live in peace with each other, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good, what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually with thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with content but test them all and hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, Pray for us. Greet all, all God's people with the holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thank you. Words to, words um, in our next song, uh, in the bridge section say, many are the wonders you have done and many are the things that you have planned. As we've already heard, um, God is faithful. Uh, he has done it. He will do it. Um, and we can trust in him. Um, it also says in God's word that we were, before knowing God, without hope and without God in this world. And now through Jesus Christ, we, we can belong. We can belong to God. We can belong to his family. Uh, and uh, let's re rejoice in that now as we sing our, uh, another song. Before the kids, the kids go now, yeah. So the kids can go out with Helena uh, towards the end of this song. 
and I'll win all his love. Let's stand to see you. Everybody's got got one of these pages, okay? Now don't cheat and start reading now. But I just need you to look at it. Make sure you have one, all right? If you don't have one, just raise your hand, and then Kirsten or Toy can, can grab one for you. I think we've got a puppy in the back. You never know who's going to show up for church here. You 
You know, last week, as Chris was talking to us, we're going through the book of 1 Thessalonians, and, and it's talking about the second coming and the joy that we have because we know what is to come. And that's all great. But it's not to just focus on that and forget that we're here in the present for a reason, too. It's one of these things that we have to make sure that we are, because of the knowledge we know what is coming, we're doing what we need to be doing in the present as a church body, as believers in Christ, and as we go through the present, let the future inform that. I've seen too many people get lost in the whole what's coming part, and we forget that we have to be doing something here. We forget that we have to be showing the love of Christ here on a day-to-day -day basis, and, and that love change us so that people can then see the love of Christ in day-to-day -day life. And that's kind of what, what Paul is doing here. Um, as, he, as he comes into this part of the letter, he, he wants us to, to see that we are to be a prepared church, that we should stand united, and that we should be a gospel community that is loving each other the right way and then loving others the right way. And so when we, when we look at this, he's, he's wanting everybody to see, look, this is, how, this is the practical side of what we're supposed to be doing. On a daily basis. Now, how many people would agree that sometimes it's not easy to love people? I'll admit sometimes it's not easy to love me. Okay? Sometimes in my own home, you know what? Maybe I'm just irritating my kids. Maybe I'm just irritating Sarah. And it's not easy to love me. And I'm sure, if we're honest, we would all say at some points, it's not easy to love us. So what do we do in those cases? It's easy to love people when everything's great. But when there's friction or tension and stuff like that, we're called to love with the love of Christ regardless. And, and as we look through this, Paul's kind of saying, okay, I, I've got two different things I want you to see, but all of it fits together. And, and in recognizing that, we, we want to go through this and, and realize that we have to live life not in a vacuum, but in a community. If no one's around us and nothing's bothering us, it's easy to do things the right way, right? Because nobody's, nobody's going to challenge us on it. Nobody's going to do anything that's going to bother us. But we don't live in a vacuum, do we? We live in a community. We live in a group. God gives us a church family that we will live life with. And inevitably, even in this church family, there will be things that will cause tension and friction sometimes. So how do we react to that? What do we do in that? How should the church operate in a way that it shines a light to the community that we're in, to the area of Abbey Wood that we are in? How will Abbey Wood Community Church be known? And it comes through the, the daily workings of what it ha we have here in Scripture. Now, the first part, it says... Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Now, one of the things that, that we always struggle with as leaders is we want to make sure we're doing things in the right way. We want to make sure we're leading in the right way, serving in the right way, loving in the right way. And it's not always easy. When we were going through as leaders trying to, to work out all the inner workings of the Constitution and the handbook, I'd say we probably spent three weeks on what was required of the leadership first. <laughs> because we're going, okay, we know each other, we know what we expect, but we have to think long term. 15 years, 20 years from now, how do we want Abbeywood Community Church to be led biblically, scripturally? And I realize that, that for some people this may be easy because the leaders that they've always had in church have, have led in the right way. But then I also understand that some people may have had a bad experience. Um, I realized this a few years ago and as I was talking to a friend of mine and, and um, he had a really bad experience with a pastor where the pastor basically led like a dictator. And it was his way or no way. And, and so he was like, well, I, I'm, I hesitate to come to your church because then if you become my pastor, then things will be different. I go, why? And he shared with me the experience, and I said, I think we need to, to really understand what it means 
to be a leader or a pastor in a church. I said, I think we need to understand what, what we're call, how we're called to do, how we're called to lead in a way that is servant leadership, that is humble, and that is seeking God daily. And, and as leaders, what we have to do is we have to look at Christ first for that example. And if we look in Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to, 20, uh, 42 to 45, it says, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, lorded over them, as their officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great amongst you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. This is servant leadership. A leader that follows Christ as he attempts to serve and lead the flock that's been entrusted to him as an under-shepherd. Truth is this, we're not in control. God's in control. We have to lead in a, humbly, in a humble way to where God is able to use us to proclaim the gospel, to love the flock, and sometimes we have to admonish, and sometimes we have to encourage, and sometimes we have to teach in the hardest situations that you can imagine. Everything has to be done in a loving way, in a caring way. Why? Because we have to show the love of Christ that Christ has given us first. And, and for that reason, as a church, what we need as leaders is fervent prayer. We need encouragement. We need love as we try to serve and lead in a, in a way that God is directing us to lead the church. And so if we're looking at things in that way, no matter who's in charge, if they're, if they're leading in the right way, we go, okay, we need to be praying for them. We need to be encouraging them. We need to love them. Why? Because they're part of the church body just like everybody else. See, the one thing that, that Chris and Jeff and I are always thinking about is making sure that everybody realizes there's no, we're all in this together kind of thing. It's not... <laughs> I've been to places where they, they try to t put you up on a pedestal, and I'm like, don't put me up on a pedestal, then I fall further. I had one guy that said, you know what, um, well, well, because you said it, I mean, I listened to it. I'm like, no, check me on it. Check scripture. Make sure that what I'm saying is scripturally correct. That's what we all are called to do. No matter what's being said by whoever, we are called as believers to check and make sure that it's correct by God's word. Don't take my word for it. Check me up on it. Don't take Chris's word. Check up. Jeff, same thing. Or whoever may be preaching. That's what we're called to do as a church body. And then, then Paul begins to shift things here, and he, he begins to talk to the church as a whole. And we know this because he says brothers and sisters. So he's, put, he's putting everybody out there on the same page. He goes, hey, I need you to be paying attention and listen to this. And what he says is, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, Warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, and make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. So Paul wants the church to see the responsibilities we have to the body and how we should live out this love in the church body that is the body of Christ. Notice it isn't just the responsibility of the leaders to do these things. It is the responsibility of the church family to do these things. And you say, well, I look at what he's just asked us to do, and I don't like some of those things. Get over it. We have to get out of our comfort zone to love people. We have to expose ourselves to love people. Which means we have to be vulnerable, we have to be honest, we have to be open. And it's not always easy, but we're still called to do it. Why? Because that's how family works. Well, that's how it should work. In a day-to-day -day basis. There should be a spirit of togetherness in the church body where we care for one another in a way that is different than the world. In the world, if someone wrongs someone else, a lot of times they're just written off and see it, they're gone. Now I want you to look at this paper. So if you're looking at me, don't look at me. Look at the paper. <laughs> and what it says here is the one another's. And it says, how, flesh or spirit, how are we dealing with others? 
And it's got Galatians 5, 16 to 18. It says, so I, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And if you look at the left side of the paper, it talks about the acts of the flesh, and it goes through. And if we are reacting in the flesh... What we will have is those lists of bullet points that are on the left-hand side, which if you look at it very long, you realize, not a great list. But then we look at the right side, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. And then we have this list of bullet points, and we've got the verse citations there as well. That is how we are called to deal with one another, to live as a church family with one another. Years ago, um, my dad helped run a, a Bible institute for Spanish pastors in Miami. And he would put this list out in front of everybody every term. And said, if there is, is there any disagreement or thing that could happen that if two people are committed to doing it God's way, won't be worked out on this list. Because if you if you find, give me a situation where that can happen, I'll pass you for the term. You don't have to do anything else. Nobody was ever able to come up with a situation where it didn't apply. But notice, we have to submit our hearts to doing it God's way, not ours, for this to work. If we have two people that are committed to doing it God's way, we can work anything out, regardless. Because we have the love of Christ in our lives, because we understand the grace and the mercy that God has given us, and we understand that they, that person that we're dealing with, is needing the same thing. And so both of us are on the same level. We need to make sure that we're living it out in the way God says to do it. Because when we say we, we get into a situation where somebody has wronged us, what do we do? We get this list out, we look at the bullet points, we look at the passages that, that are cited there and stuff like that, and we go... Okay, now I know how I should react and what I should do. What if the other person doesn't react and do the thing that they're supposed to do? It doesn't change what we're supposed to do. And if we're called to live out to one another this way, then guess what? That's the best way we can do it. So do me a favor. Make sure you take this home. Put it up somewhere. We, we've given this out several times in the history of our church, but the last time we were thinking was when we were still at St. Paul, so it's been a while. So take this home. If you want to grab an extra one, grab an extra one. Put it a couple places in the house. Because guess what? Even in our own home, we're going to need to practice these one another. We're going to need to sit there and make sure that we are doing things the right way. Why? Because there will be situations like we see here in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 that we're going to need to deal with. The four, one of the first things that, that Paul says is he just said, you know, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Those who are causing issues in the body itself need to be spoken to. Now we're to lovingly speak to them for the benefit of the body. And he said, they're going to say, well, I don't like confronting people. There will be times where we have to confront people if the behavior is wrong, if we know that scripturally they're doing something that's wrong. Now, do we walk up to them after gossiping about them and then be like, you need to stop? No. we got to do it the right way. We go in a loving way. We say, hey, I may, I've just noticed something. I, I just want to say, I don't think that's right. And they may be upset at that moment. They may be angry with you in that moment. They may burst out and just say something in that moment. And we're called to say, I love you, and that's why I'm telling you this. And you know what? They may react in a different way. They may sit there and go, I really appreciate you coming to me and telling me this and stuff like that. Regardless of the reaction, we're still called to do it in the right way. Why? Because it is for the benefit of the body. We were laughing and talking a few minutes ago about how different, your body doesn't always work right. Mine has this thing about rebelling against me all the time. 
my pancreas tries to kill me, my back tries to make me lay down all the time, my shoulders start, and I'm sitting there going, I am falling apart. And when you have something wrong with the body, you're supposed to address it, right? Well, this is the church body. And he says very clearly, warn those who are idle and disruptive. So we have to go in a right way, in a loving way, in a, in, in a way that shows the love of Christ in those moments. Next, Paul points out that we need to encourage the disheartened or the discouraged. Paul would have known of the, the persecution that had been happening there in Thessalonica, right? He would have known that, that people had been dealing with a lot of persecution, a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure from the city leaders, all these different things. And so people may have gotten discouraged. Maybe they had come to know Christ, and, and because they knew Christ, they understood the consequences of not knowing Christ as their Savior. And they think of the one, their family members who have already passed on, so maybe they got discouraged and disheartened because they know that their family didn't know. Whatever the case may be, he sends, he's sitting there saying, look, you, we need to encourage those people who are discouraged. For whatever reason they're down, we're to come alongside them. To encourage them, to pray with them, to live life with them. Now when we do that, it reminds us of Romans 12, 15, where it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. We're called to walk side by side as a church body and do things in a way that shows the love of Christ daily. Next thing he says is what? He says, help the weak. Now, as I was studying this week, everybody seemed to point out the same thing. He's not talking about the weak spiritually here because he just talked about the, those who are discouraged in, in faith and stuff like that. And now he's saying help the weak. And so it, it implies that there is physical needs or, or, or other needs that are happening. And so he's saying, look, we need to help those who are in these types of struggles. We can't just, we have to, yes, minister to the heart. But sometimes when the physical needs are suffering, we need to step in with those. That way they can focus then the heart on God. We can't just sit there and say, you know, be well fed and keep warm like it says. We have to actually do something about it. We have to give them, help them out. There needs to be a, a side of, of physical well-being to where that also goes with the spiritual. So when we see someone who has need, let's not shy away from them. Let us step up. If God has given us the ability to do so, we, we meet those needs. Maybe there's someone who's struggling here today and you sit there and say, well, I'm embarrassed to say something that, that I've got a need. Don't be embarrassed. Come and talk to us as leaders. We're called to help out one another. We're called to care for one another. Love one another. That doesn't just mean spiritually. That means everything. Then Paul points out, as we see here, it says, be patient with everyone. Such an important thing that we all have to practice. See, but, but understand this. All of these things that he's pointing out, all of these require something in order to do them correctly, and that is keeping Christ at the center of our lives, in our walk. That way we can then encourage, help, be patient, and even warn those who are idle. And disruptive. We have to make sure Christ is at the center of our walk and our relationship so that we can do these things and minister to people the right way. It's through a strong relationship with Christ that we can love and care for people the way we should be. It is through our dependence on him that we can depend on each other. If we try to do all this stuff in our own strength, we will fail. And we'll probably crash and burn ourselves in the process. But if we're in the middle of a thriving relationship with Christ, then he gives us strength so that then we can help others and encourage others. It's not something where we do it all on our own strength. A lot of times we see this happen in, in churches where you, you have someone who's been, been there week by week by week, and all of a sudden, poof, they disappear. And you're going, what happened? A lot of times it's because they've been doing it on their own strength and they get so discouraged because they can't seem to keep their feet under themselves and they've been trying to serve and help everybody else. There's a, we're out of balance at that point. We've got to be walking with Christ so that then we can minister the right way to others. 
Now Paul puts something here that maybe we don't expect, but it's so important. Has anyone ever tried to help or minister to someone that didn't really appreciate or accept it? These people start to smile and snicker and nod their heads up. Yeah, because why? Because maybe we caught them at a bad time. Or maybe they were just not walking right, so they, their reaction is out of, out of conviction or something like that. But it doesn't change how we're supposed to react because the next verse, it says, make sure, or the next part of verse 15 says, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. So if somebody responds to us in the wrong way, what are we supposed to do? Tell them that they were wrong again, of course. <laughs> Anybody ever tried to put out a fire by throwing kerosene or petrol on it? doesn't really work. It's like when you have something that's really irritated and you just go, you just need to calm down. Yeah, because that works. That's not the way we should do it. Sometimes we have to remember the soft answer turns away around, right? Just because they respond in a negative way doesn't mean that we then double down and we respond back to them in a negative way. Remember, it says, first, right before that, be patient with everyone and then make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrongs. It's like Paul knows how people react. It's like he's been in ministry for a while and figured out people aren't perfect, so they're going to react in an imperfect way. We all do it at some point. But we're called to live out to one another's regardless of the other person's response. We can only do that with a heart that is submitted completely doing it God's way and not our own. So our reactions will tell more about how we're walking with Christ than anything else. Because if we're walking correctly, then when somebody responds to us in the wrong way, we will still respond to them in the right way. Doesn't that just sound how the world works? You know, when we see someone, there's a disagreement about something. So of course, one person goes, you know what, I'm not going to sleep to their level. That's how the world works, right? No. See, all these things are called to be different than the way the world reacts. If the world had it figured out, we'd be fine. But our world's a mess because it's broken. That's why God's way is different than anything that the world will ever show us or give us. There should be a difference in how we as a church respond because we respond in Christ. The next part says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, the command here to rejoice always may seem strange to some, and I was trying to figure out the best way to kind of approach it, and then I was reading one of the commentaries, and it had the best way, so I'm just going to read that. It's up here on the screen, and it kind of, kind of helps us out. It says, for many Christians, the command to rejoice always is perplexing. Christians like to talk about such biblical truths, but often struggle to put them into practice. Given life's hurts, pains, and sorrows, one may legitimately question how a person could possibly always rejoice. The answer is not as difficult as it may appear. Joy is not something that we work on. Joy is something that we live in. We are able to experience constant joy because of the presence of God's Spirit in you, as it says in Galatians 5.22. Our joy is never generated from the outside, but is always from the inside out. It is Christ that allows us to rejoice always because the fact that he is in control, that we can rejoice regardless of the circumstances. That's why when every time I've heard somebody say, well, you know, I just think positively. That runs out. And then we just crash and burn. Thinking positively is something where we're trying to manufacture it from the outside. But if we remember that regardless of whatever the circumstances may be, that Christ is in control, that God has a plan for us, that he promises to never leave us or forsake us, that means no matter what that we, situation we're in, if we remember that at that point that he is in control, we can rest and have joy in that fact. That is how Paul, when he's writing the, the, the book of Philippians or the letter to the church in Philippi, he talks about joy more than anything else in that book. And yet what? He's sitting in prison. Innocently sitting in prison, yet he's talking about joy. And he says things like, well, I know I've been changed for Christ. 
And a lot of us, let's be honest, if we're sitting there handcuffed to a wall, we'd be like, this is not good. And he's going, these are great. It's because of Christ. I've got a captive audience. The guards can't leave me. And we're going, what? That's because his joy came from the inside out because he was recognizing who was in control, and that was God. Next, Paul exhorts them to pray continually. Now, this is not just walking around constantly, just muttering something to ourselves. And it's not just sitting there repeating something over and over and over that we read. This is just keeping a, a, an open, honest conversation happening with God. He wants to hear from us. Now, think about that fact. The creator of all things wants to know and have communication with us. Is it because we're that good and interesting? No, it's because he loves us because he created us in his image. He cares for us, even when we can't even care for ourselves. He loves us, even when we're unlovable. And so when it says to pray continually, he's saying, look, I want you to be engaged with me in conversation. Now, does that mean when you're on the train and you're heading into work or you're, you're driving and you're on your way to work or, or, or maybe you're retired and you're sitting there in the morning reading the morning news that you've got to sit there and you got to close your eyes, you get all spiritual, get on your knees. If you do that in the train, people are going to go, what are you doing? No, it's just simply having a conversation with God. Maybe it's, Lord, thank you for just giving me the strength to get up this morning. Thank you for loving me enough to give me the breath that I breathe right now. Maybe there's something going on that's so that's hurting so much that you sit there and say, Lord, I don't even know how to pray for this or what to pray. And you just ask the Holy Spirit to just groan for you. Or maybe things are great. You're saying, Lord, thank you for the birds that are singing outside. The wonderful place you've given us to be able to meet today. But it's this, this heart and attitude of prayer that when we continuously do it, it is fundamental and foundational in our walk with Christ. I saw somebody describe it one time as prayer is the powerhouse of the relationship with Christ because it's us having that constant connection. I said this a few months ago and people thought I was completely crazy. If you're having a hard time remember to pray continually, put a 50p coin in the bottom of your shoe. You're like, what? But if you do that, put it in there, you'll, start, you'll get used to it and then all of a sudden you'll take a step and it'll shift and you'll go, oh yeah. And you'll feel it. Now, don't put a pound coin. Those are too thick. Okay? I don't need somebody coming to this church going, my foot's hurting really bad because I've been out of balance. No, 50 feet coin. They're flat, but they're big enough to feel. They should tell that to our teenagers. I'm like, just do that. And then when when, when you feel that, that coin move, just, Lord, thank you for this. Or, Lord, help me with that. Or whatever the case may be. But it just reminds us to have that constant attitude of prayer. It's a simple solution just to help us kind of engage. Oh, yeah. But it works. Next thing we have here says, Give thanks in all circumstances. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. Now, somebody may sit there and read and go, How on earth do I give thanks in all circumstances? And one of the authors that I was reading this week, he said, notice it says in all circumstances, not for all circumstances. Sometimes we sit there and think we have, we're saying be thankful for what's happening. No, sometimes we just need to be thankful in the circumstance. And we have to remember that, that God is sovereign and he can use anything to help us grow. And then I, found, I came across this quote in the same commentary, it says, only God could take the thousands of details of a person's life, some good and some bad, and weave them into a beautiful tapestry of his perfect plan. From the human perspective, many of life's occurrences, especially the painful ones, appear to have little intrinsic value. However, if we had God's perspective, we would be able to view each of these details in a different way. Providence affirms that no detail is irrelevant or insignificant. God is using everything for our ultimate good and his everlasting glory. Hence, to give thanks in everything is to affirm our resolute belief that God is overseeing every detail of our lives. 
anybody ever done, seen one of those things where they're like, you know, identify this little thing and they zoom in really, really close to something and you're trying to identify what it is and you're looking at it going, it looks like an alien. And then all of a sudden they pull out and it's like the inside of a flower or something. You're like, oh, okay. We get so focused on the little zoomed in view and God's going, no, I'm seeing the whole tapestry. I see how this will help you in this later on. I see how this thing that you're going through now will be the thing that allows you to step out in faith over here when I call you to do this. And that should encourage us. That should encourage us in a way that we remember that God's got a perfect plan. And in that plan, he has his best for us. Now, it doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's all simple. But it means his best. And think about it. What if we thought something was for our best and then later found out that it really wasn't? I'll trust his best over my best idea any day of the week. But we need to be giving thanks in all circumstances for this is the will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, If we're living out the things that we see in this passage, God will show his light through us to everyone around us. If people come in here, and maybe this is your first time you go, you know, I, I don't really know anybody here. I hope you see the bond that we have in the church. And if you look at the, the, the massive differences in people's backgrounds, cultures, everything else like that, and go, how does all this fit together? The quick answer is God. You take God out of the picture, it doesn't make any sense. But the beautiful thing about God's church is that he wants people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation to come to him. To be united in his body. And to be salt and light in the world around us. And here he's telling us, Paul's reminded us, look, this is the stuff we got to focus on. This is how we show the difference between a, a community, a gospel community that is founded and centered on Christ versus what the, the, the world gives you. So this week, take some time to just go through this. It's a great reminder for us to go, okay, Lord, what, how is it that I'm supposed to be reacting and acting? And then see how God can bless us as we minister to each other and care for each other in these different ways. And when we have Christ at the center, see what a difference it makes for us to then go out and minister to those that are in our community and our world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you don't just give us instructions and say good luck. You, you actually tell us how we should go about doing it. Lord, I know this, this letter was written to the church in Thessalonica so many years ago, Lord, but, but its truth is still applicable today to her, us here at Abbey Wood. Pray that we would faithfully serve and minister to each other, to care for each other, to love each other, and even sometimes admonish each other when it's needed. But Lord, help us to do things in the right way. Help us to love and serve in the right way. Help us to care in the right way. Help us to be salt and light in this in this area, Lord. Help people to know people to know us by the love that we have for one another. In Jesus' name.
Um, in two weeks' time, we've got Easter, and uh, just a, a heads up that we're hoping th this 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 space on Good Friday is occupied, um, unfortunately. So um, they've said we can meet over there <laughs> um, in the old Abbey, believe it or not. So we can um, take our Good Friday service in the Abbey, weather permitting, of course. Um, so if it's like today, I'm not really sure what's going to happen. Um, I guess we just keep everyone posted, but the plan is just to have a very short open air service uh, celebrating Good Friday, Jesus' death. And then after that, um, anyone who wants to, we're going to take a walk in the woods. And uh, if people afterwards want to grab a coffee or something to eat here, or if the weather's really great, bring a picnic. Um, so again, it's all subject to weather, um, but hopefully that will happen Good Friday. And then on the Saturday, as we said, we're going to do the stall. So again, you'll be hearing about that soon, and we need people to sign up. And then also on the Sunday, Easter Sunday, we'll be celebrating together. Well, let's finish again with prayer. And then, like I said, make, make the most of the time to, to catch up with people, talk to each other, practice these one another that we've heard about. Um, if you see people putting away chairs and stuff, that doesn't mean you have to leave. <laughs> so it needs to be done. So it's not telling you to go. Uh, you can stay as that's done. Uh, no problem. Do stick around. Let's pray. Lord, again, we do thank you for for your word, for its encouragement, for its challenge. We pray, Lord God, uh, for you continue to, to work in our lives um, as we've already prayed um, beyond today, as we meditate and reflect on your, your scriptures and, and these words that we've been given to take home with us as well, one of us. But we thank you again for your church. We thank you that you've brought us into your family uh, through Jesus Christ. If we put our trust in him, we now belong to you as God. You are our Father, and that makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for the family of God. And Lord, even as we've heard this morning, it's not always easy. We thank you, Lord. It's worth it to work it. Um, because as your word says, it's good and it's pleasant when brothers and sisters live in harmony. So, Lord, we get the blessing and benefit of seeking to do life like you've not called us to do. But also, as we've heard in your word recently, also um, through our good deeds, and through our love for one another, others can come to see you, can come to know you. By, by our love for one another, others will know that we are your disciples. By our good deeds, others will come to glorify you. And so, Lord, we continue to pray for that as well. That you'll help us to be united, not only because it will bless us and give you glory, but also so that others can see uh, that you are the light of the world, that you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. Uh, life and salvation is found only 